Dispenser going up. Well, I guess that'll do. Huh? What? Oh. Oh, oh yeah, plane engineer. Defending Dust Bowl again, huh? Oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Oh, look at enemy. Oh, he died right away. Awesome. Oh, wow, I got a godlike kill streak. Oh, that's great. Okay. Oh, 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 whoa. Oh, now I'm on Frontier. That's, uh, that's a pretty cool sentry spot. <laughs> Oh, it's single-handedly stuffing that Uber Pyro. Actually, it's just uh, you know, it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny. That's that spot in particular is one of my favorites actually because it defends so many angles. And now that I've told you guys about it, that spot will be uh, used more and more and become overall less effective. <laughs> Look, I like playing engineer, obviously, and uh, I'm not alone. Engineer is a very popular class, but there's always been this kind of stigma attached to the uh, engineer gaming experience, and that is. <laughs> But that's clearly not true if you play it right. I mean, sometimes being the only engineer on your team can be one of the most stressful experiences of your entire life. And it should be. I mean, when you're the guy preventing all these other guys from being able to move freely around the map, I mean, what do you expect? But I get it. When people say engineer is boring or whatever, what they really mean is that he's a background character. It doesn't really feel like you participate in the actual game that everyone else is playing because, you know, you have work to do. You have stuff to build. You have things to maintain. And, uh, you know, that is just completely wrong. Battle engineer, man. You saw the title of this video. You clicked on it. Battle Engineer, and here's the thing, you probably think you know what Battle Engineer is, right? It's, you know, where you use the gunslinger and spam mini sentries so the scout main will stop bullying you. That's it. No. No, dude. Battle Engineer is not a loadout. It's not even a subclass, man. You people have your mind stuck in the past. You're a slave to the metagame, bro. <coughs> I'm being completely 100% serious when I say that Battle Engineer is not the weapons that you equip. It's not the buildings that you neglect. Battle Engineer is a playstyle. It's a mindset. And you saw the title of this video, you see how long this thing is, so buckle up, gamers. This is the ultimate guide to Battle Engineer. The first thing that usually comes up when it's implied that Battle NG is a legitimately viable playstyle is the question, you're just a light class shooting people with a shotgun, so why don't you just play Scout instead? Well, it's a good question actually because Engineer Shotgun does less damage than the Scatter Gun and the Engineer is considerably slower than the Scout is, but Scout serves a very specific purpose and he hardly deviates from it. The Battle NG playstyle is sort of like a dynamic Scout, one that can quickly switch between defending and attacking depending on the situation, but also simultaneously simultaneously maintaining that supportive role. The specifics of this will be elaborated upon during the course of this video, but for now, let's just say that Battle NG is viable when you don't approach it exactly how you would if you were just playing Scout. Consider the fact that almost every single one of the Engineer's unlockable weapons are designed to work alongside the Engineer's buildings, and you can understand why just equipping the Gunslinger for the extra 25 health and the Widowmaker to avoid reloading is exactly as gimmicky as the entire Battle NG label is viewed as. The Engineer is designed to construct buildings, and working those buildings into the Battle Engineer playstyle is exactly what makes it unique, exciting, and viable. Which is why the very first thing that I want to talk about is this. Do, do not, not neglect, neglect your, your buildings. buildings. Not only do they make the Engineer considerably stronger, they greatly help your team, which in turn helps you. The Sentry Gun is not only a fantastic area denial and defensive tool, but it is also the extra DPS that the Battle Engine needs to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone who challenges him directly. The Dispenser is not only a fantastic defensive supportive building, but it also serves as your very own personal health pack and ammo pack that you can retreat to whenever you need topping off. And the teleporter is not only the building that wins games for your entire team, but it also solves the issue of engineers' limited mobility, especially when used in conjunction with the Eureka effect. Buildings are what make the engineer the engineer, so always remember this acronym when playing Battle Engine. A B B. Always be building. Wait, that doesn't work. It needs to be ABC. Always be...
constructing. Always be constructing. Got it. Okay, so the way Engineer is normally played can be considered the ultimate multitasker, right? And Battle Engi is no different. You should always be present on the front lines when you can, but you should also be doing your chores at the same time. This means not only should you ABC always be constructing, you should be maintaining your buildings when you have a chance, and you should also be as aware of the objective as you normally would be if you were playing level 3 Engineer. Battle Engi can create space just as effectively as any other combat class can as long as you play your cards right and there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to push the cart or capture the control point when the opportunity presents itself. Overall, the point I'd like to drive home before we get into the nitty gritty of playing Battle NG in this video is this. Don't forget that you're still an engineer and you have a class role to uphold. And actually, don't think of it like you're doing chores. That's honestly a bad way of looking at it because it implies that it's something that you should be doing as an obligation, but it's really not. Utilizing all of your buildings is the secret to the power of the Battle Engineer playstyle, and once you understand that, you've already become 10 times more effective than the person who only builds a mini sentry somewhere and just charges forward with a shotgun. A big part of the Battle Engineer mindset is the concept of unchaining yourself from the usual nesting mentality. An Engineer nest is as recognizable as any other iconic part of Team Fortress 2. It's an area where an NG has all of his buildings, sentry, dispenser, and teleporter exit within easy reach, usually never leaving his sight so he can constantly focus on maintaining them. And by the way, this is a totally legitimate and effective way to play Engineer on defense, but it's inherently a strictly defensive playstyle, which makes total sense because Engineer is listed as a defense defense class in the menu alongside Demo Man and Heavy. So what the Battle Engi playstyle aims to do is expand the engineer's horizons from an exclusively defensive shut-in who lets his buildings do all of the work, to a defensively offensive explorer who uses his buildings in combination with his primary and secondary weapons in order to be more present in team fights and flank routes, whose quote-unquote nest is ever-changing and constantly being repositioned to benefit the moment-to-moment -moment situation. This is a pretty simple concept, and I've talked about it many times before, so I will be relatively brief here, but being defensively offensive means that you are constantly moving your bubble of influence to assist you and your team, such as putting your sentry in a position that covers a common staging area that the enemy would use to attack the control point, and then using that confusion associated with suddenly encountering a sentry gun in a forward area to attack from a second angle with your actual gun. This guy says I should probably stop running into sentries. I mean, I'm cool with it. On the other side of this point, making sure that we can keep the staging area by placing a mini sentry that not only defends that area, but will also punish anyone who challenges the control point. Right here, I see that the sentry goes down, but I'm too weak to push, so I wait for this health pack to respawn. A spy shows up and gets me down to one health, but he dies to the mini right as I get the pack. The mini sentry's doing work, actually, so the heavy dies to my shotgun and it's only the medic left. I beef, but he dies to the mini sentry as well, and I can finish the gap before anyone else can stop me. And why would they want to stop me when I have the perfect wingman on my back? Constantly employing your sentry gun to make space for yourself while you wreak havoc within that space you've created is exactly what playing defensively offensive means. Using the combination of your gun and your quote-unquote gun to output more consistent DPS against enemies who are unprepared to exist within that spontaneous bubble of influence. The typical defensive engineer nest is anything but spontaneous. A level 3 sentry gun is difficult to move safely, so they usually remain in the same place, making them trivial to avoid and pretty easy to coordinate against. But when you actively play defensively offensive, the predictability of where you or your sentry gun will be during any given moment is reduced to zero. Instead of waiting for the enemy to come to you with the advantage of knowing what they're about to deal with, you're instead waiting for the enemy to end up in your domain when they are not expecting it, and then they have two sources of damage to deal with. This is the core of what the Battle Engineer playstyle is all about, and it's important to understand this before you can apply the rest of the things that we plan on going over in this guide. But there is just one more thing before we officially start talking about the specifics. Come on, let's go. What? Medic, where'd you go? Let's go in. You're an engineer. When the last light warms the rock. All right, this guy's healing me. Come on, get full Uber. Come on, let's go. Yes, okay, let's go in. No, what? Medic. What? 
Why? Has this ever happened to you? Of course it has, because honestly, it does kind of make sense. Medic players are usually in one of two modes. Heal whichever guy has the explosives, or try to recreate meet the medic with a random heavy. Oh yeah, give it to the heavy. Look, he can't, get, can't kill anyone. And he gets sniped right afterwards. Everything else is either uber charge building fodder or just straight up not worth their time. Like this guy literally walks right through an engineer with 34 health just to run towards the more important heal target, a sniper with the Razorback on. Has this ever happened? But I'm here to tell you that if you are playing medic, it is 100% worth healing, buffing, pocketing, and even uber charging a battle engineer when you see them putting work on the front lines. Has that ever happened to you? Oh. Getting all players to full health is pretty much the medic's default MO, so washing away the damage you've taken by standing near a medic isn't too hard. Getting properly and consistently overhealed is a bit rarer, but boy oh boy is it greatly appreciated, and it can save your life just as much as it can for anyone else. Appreciate it, Doc. If you can work with your medic to get either one of those two things, great! great. Health is a resource, and just like metal you find dropped on the ground, it should be spent appropriately. But getting pocketed and possibly even Ubered, uh, now that is gonna be a little harder to just find happening in a random pub. But boy, let me tell you, it is effective, okay? Using stock Uber on a shotgun NG can be deadly in certain circumstances, especially when there isn't much ground to cover. But honestly, making a player invulnerable gets its value from the space it creates more than the enemies that are eliminated as a result. So yeah, if there's an engineer on the front lines that is locked and loaded, don't turn up your nose at the idea just because you might not get a 6K. But when it comes to the frontier justice, however, that is where making a battle engineer the target of your uber can be deadly and create space. Consider this moment right here where I clearly have a bright red glowing frontier justice out and ready to unload and this medic recognizes that and pops on me. Name one blue food, huh? Uh, blue Gatorade. I then proceed to everyone on the point with guaranteed crits until I finally run out, but guess what motherfucker? My sentry has a kill on it so I quickly destroy it for three more crits and bam, a clean 4k on the ubered engineer. Would have been five if that guy didn't steal that one, but hey, I guess I'll let the poor demo man get his kill. You know, they never get ubered after all. So if you're a medic who wants to make space and get kills, just keep an eye on your engineer's frontier justice. If it's glowing, ask him how many he's got stored on that thing. If it's more than three, you know what to do. Here, I have a glow stick in my hand and H2 asks me, how many do you have? And I reply with, uh, four. Do you want to do a? You want to do a thing? And so we did a thing, completely denying their Crits Creek medic, who understandably explodes out of respect, which saves me from using my last crit on him. Time to use it on the other medic instead. See you later. And then Gene Butter knives both of us in the back. What the fuck? How was all of that fail stab? Because spy is a bad class. Frontier Justice crits are one thing, but if you're really looking for damage output, the Crits Krieg is the obvious choice, and using it on the engineer's shotgun is no joke. But even so, the weapon of choice for true synergy with the Crits Krieg battle engineer is not necessarily the shotgun. Dane, do you want the crits when I have? Uh, yes. Uh, one second. <laughs> I'll be right back. Clearly there is a winner when it comes to the engineer's primary weapons that pair best with a pocket medic, and that is the Widowmaker. The triple damage output from the Crits Creek makes it so not only will the engineer never have to reload, allowing for the destruction to go on for, well, theoretically forever, the lack of damage falloff means that the engineer doesn't even need to close the distance for his shots to connect, which is true for anything that shoots bullets, but the self-reload makes pretty much any target a risk-free option under the effect of the Crits Creek. Fucking shotgun, bitch. That's not the shotgun, that's the Widowmaker, bitch. I wanted to talk about the Battle NG's relationship with the medic early on in this video because I felt like I should make it clear that the long-standing and entirely false idea of the engineer being a non-damage dealing class extends past the perspective of engineer players and leaks into the mindset of other players as well. The medic obviously has much better choices when it comes to DPS classes to pocket, but straight up disregarding engineers, especially when it comes to engineers who battle, is a huge missed opportunity for everyone involved and unfortunately has stifled the potential this place style truly has. So please, if you are playing medic, always heal battle engines to full, try to give them overheal buffs, highly consider pocketing one when you see them going off, and maybe give them an uber or crits when they're ready to go in. At the very least, even just a crossbow bolt from downtown while they single-handedly win the game for you will not go unrewarded or underappreciated.
The engineer exists in a world full of danger. He's a light class with two secondaries for weapons and his best source of DPS takes time to set up, leaving him open to getting crapped on pretty easily. But I've actually discovered the reason why engineer is so weak compared to other combat classes and it's going to blow your mind. Engineer is weak because enemies can see him. Yeah, uh, what I'm getting around to is basically that age-old first-person shooter golden rule. It's a lot easier to kill an enemy when they didn't even know you were there. That's why positioning is so important in TF2, but it's extremely important for the Battle Engineer playstyle because getting into a place that you're not supposed to be in makes it harder for enemies to retaliate, not only because of the simple fact that they take damage before they can dish it back, but because it's often just so confusing. It causes emotional damage as well, like what the hell was that engineer doing there? I didn't even see... Well, to be fair, what the hell was I doing? But positioning yourself in an optimal spot for engineer jump scares is one thing, but not every enemy you encounter is going to be conveniently facing the other way when you see them. So being able to use corners and walls to put yourself into better micro situations is usually the best way to approach a fight with someone who wants to kill you. Take this fight here for example. I see this heavy in the stairwell and I decide to push him. As I make my way up to him, he does the Tommy Slav thing and suddenly appears in front of me, giving me quite the scare, but now my hubris has landed me in a disadvantageous position. I'm not only on the low ground against a revved up heavy, I'm also not nearly as close as I need to be to do good damage and if I retreat through the same door that I entered through, he'll just easily gun me down. So, I take the only realistic option left and position myself underneath him so that when he follows me down, he loses track of me for a brief moment, which allows me to get a couple good shots on him while he readjusts. I successfully throw off his tracking by moving erratically and secure the kill. Intentionally putting yourself in a position where the enemy chasing you will have to readjust their aim in order to land shots is very effective, so being able to move fluidly around the map is an invaluable skill in the Battle Engineer's toolkit. But in order to intentionally put yourself in these positions where you can influence your enemy into a bubble of influence, you're going to have to start flanking. Flanking can mean anything from running around a building to pop up behind an enemy who is looking for you on the other side of it, to using the designated flank routes that every map has integrated into its design. But for the purpose of this, when I'm talking about flanking, I mean recognizing where the main choke point is, like where all the spam and chaos is happening, and choosing to take the alternate route. This is where the domain of Battle Engineer exists and thrives, because while you may not be equipped to handle a pocket of demo man spamming pills through the choke, you can definitely handle the odd scout or soldier who wanders through looking to do exactly what you're doing. And if nobody else is watching the flank routes, well then you're very likely going to end up in a situation where nobody is looking at you, and you can set up your very own bubble of influence right smack dab in the middle of their entire life and gun down everybody as they flounder around wondering how they ended up inside of an engineer nest. This is where your game sense is key to being an effective flanker, being able to recognize when the side passage is open and taking the opportunity to just walk through it and be a huge thorn in the butts of players who are just too busy dealing with what's in front of them to bother worrying about the possibility of a sentry gun appearing behind them. It's powerful. It's fun. The effective opportunities for this very basic strategy are endless, such as flanking around to cut off the escape as your team pushes the enemy back. Stop that engineer, damn it! Ah, you suck. Sorry, boy. I am the better spy! Or setting up your bubble right behind an incoming push so that their entire team is either forced to stop pushing to deal with you, or just die because who would have expected the sentry nest they thought they were pushing into to actually be right behind them all along. Certain areas of maps are also perfect for what I like to call a flank rotation, which is where you basically run around in a side area, usually rotating between health packs, while constantly giving enemies the slip as they try to figure out where you are, where your sentry gun is at, and why they're suddenly dead to that engineer they weren't even aware was behind them. And of course, you can effectively just post up in the area outside of their spawn and coax people to come and put down the helpless NG who probably got himself accidentally stuck behind enemy lines, but unbeknownst to them, you're completely happy in your new home. Right here I intentionally take this corner with my gunslinger out so that the pyro thinks that I don't have the ability to blast him, but I do. When roaming around looking for people to catch with their metaphorical pants down, sometimes you can end up in some pretty wacky situations, which is a big part of the fun of Battle Engineer. You never know what you're gonna find. But taking your positioning to the next level is where stuff usually gets real kooky. And that's when you can start to use the map knowledge inherent to the success of the engineer's class role to start using the terrain to your advantage. There are lots of little jumps that the engineer can clear in order to make his workflow more efficient, but that concept extends into a lot of areas that can easily put him on the high ground against enemies. And you know what they say about TF2 players, they never look up. 
but even just understanding the intricacies of the map to the degree where you know where you can stand, what props you can use to get into a position you normally couldn't, and how to effectively abuse map design in a way that doesn't even really include the use of your buildings, that is what often can get you into situations that nobody would ever expect you to be in. I highly recommend loading up a local server in single player mode and just exploring your favorite maps to find places that you can get to as engineer. It's a great way to improve your skill in the game without playing against other people. NG is a class that has limited mobility, so learning as much as you can about your typical environments is the next best thing to increasing the engineer's mobility. And lucky for him, he's not alone. Believe it or not, the engineer's buildings can push his mobility even further. I like to call this a building boost, where you stand on top of your sentry or dispenser in order to get high enough to reach something you couldn't reach normally. This can be done to place other buildings in high areas, peek your head over walls and ledges to get angles you normally wouldn't be able to see, and make jumps you normally can't make to traverse the map more efficiently. This is effectively Engineer's version of a double jump, and it comes in handy quite often if you have the metal to spare. Another way in which buildings can become useful on the battlefield is placing them in order to physically block someone from walking through it. This can be done in order to quickly stop someone from approaching you if they're walking through a tight space. You can easily prevent a demo knight from chopping your head off if they're charging at you in a predictable line, and you can even use a redeployed building as a damage sponge since they naturally gain health as they're constructing. You can also use buildings as disposable body blockers to prevent enemies from escaping. The ability to spawn an object that your enemies or yourself cannot clip through is highly underrated, and it can make your battle engine that much more dynamic. Of course, in the more classic sense of the word, the best battle building is the distraction sentry, which can be placed quickly right before you are about to start a fight with someone, or even in the middle of a fight in order to direct their attention to something other than yourself. It works especially well against scout players for some reason. But a distraction sentry that acts as an escape tool, both because it can be an impending danger to whoever sticks around and because it physically can slow pursuing enemies, is the best way to ensure your longevity while both fighting and retreating. If there's an enemy chasing you through a tight door Way, just put a building in the door frame so they physically cannot go through the door until they destroy it and by the time you do you're out of there and if you have the opportunity to pre-building a sentry or dispenser before you move it can often be the difference maker when it comes to getting a building deployed in time and it can more successfully block someone or secure a kill that you probably wouldn't have gotten and remember a building getting destroyed is often a great alarm bell giving you information about what class destroyed it and that class's location which can give you an upper hand when dealing with flanking enemies. So just keep it in mind that your buildings are an extension of you, the engineer, and you can use them to do more than just their primary function. Before you know it, your buildings will be battling just as much as you are. Hey, why not you pick on somebody your own size? That's my advice to start off this chapter. Choose your fights wisely when you can. This means if you see a player looking at you ready to fire, maybe don't walk over to him. There is no shame in retreating from a fight that you can't win before the fight even starts. In fact, it's, what do the kids say, uh, giga brain mode. And that's on site. No cap. <laughs> Jesus Christ, how long is this video? It's a simple concept, really. If you see someone you know you can kill, go for it. But if you're likely going to die in the process, maybe hold out for a better opportunity instead. Right here, I round the corner to see a lot of people. And yeah, I have Frontier Justice Grits, but I couldn't kill them all when they're all overhealed, staring me down in that little room. So I wait until they're shooting something else before I make my move. And lo and behold, by waiting until it wasn't a 3v1 and instead a proper team fight, we successfully run them over and now this guy is the one taking the 3v1 instead of me. What's in this tunnel? Oh wow, it's a pocketed soldier. I will very likely die to that because I suck. Better run away. Oh, but what's this? A soldier of my very own to fight beside me? Maybe I judged my own abilities a little too harshly there. Let's go back in. Looking for your advantages and pushing them as soon as they appear is very important when it comes to somebody as naturally squishy as the engineer. So make sure you're looking for those opportunities. If someone calls for medic, chances are they're low health. If if someone is retreating, might as well pistol them a bit if he can't afford to chase. But not every enemy is going to be just standing around with 10 health waiting for
for you to run up on them, so it's best to practice the art of creating your own advantages. This can mean using the map or the terrain to get the upper hand on someone like we went over before, but it mostly comes down to game knowledge such as how much health each class has and what each weapon is capable of. For instance, this engineer is stuck behind us, me and this heavy are having a real hard time peeking him, but I'm waiting for that Wrangler to come out because if there's anything that cornered engineers like to do, it's to use the Wrangler and I would know. As soon as that laser disappears, I know I've got three seconds before it's not disabled anymore and I act on it, finally relieving this poor NG from his caged existence. Also a little tip regarding spies that are clearly trying to matador, corner stab, or do any of those little stabby stabs on you, just stand still. I don't know, it works pretty well. But for the battle engineer in particular, the best way to create your own advantage is the classic strategy called baiting. Normally you could just bait enemies into chasing you into your teammates for them to gun down for you, but that's relatively difficult to set up reliably. But you're an engineer. You always have a teammate available who never misses, never goes AFK, and never leaves the game to go to your ex-girlfriend's wedding, Paul. It's called a sentry gun, and he's my best bud now. You know how I've kept using the phrase bubble of influence throughout this video? Well, let's elaborate on that a little bit more. Your sentry's range and line of sight is that bubble of influence. What you're influencing your enemies to do is die. So it can actually be thought of as more of like a toxic gas cloud that you and your teammates are immune to, but slowly damages whoever exists inside of that toxic gas cloud. This is where you want your enemies to be, inside of that cloud. So you should be doing whatever you can to influence people to start walking into it. This guy walked into it so hard that he left the game. I think that should probably count as two kills. The less obvious you make your cloud's location, the better. So hiding the sentry around a corner or in a bush is going to be the most effective. But it's not just about coaxing people people into the cloud, you can also force people into it by posing a threat to them outside of it, which can then leave them no other choice but to retreat from you into, you guessed it, a toxic gas cloud. I love that little gun. There are so many ways you can go about influencing players into taking damage when they don't want to be. For instance, this is what I like to call the reverse toxic gas cloud. I put the sentry in a bush and the scout has no idea where it's even shooting him from. All he knows is that he's taking damage and that he should retreat. So I don't even need to really put my crosshair on top of him. I just put it where he's about to be, running away from the cloud as expected. Get influenced. Baiting your enemies into a domain where you have the upper hand is very fun and very effective, especially on overconfident players. So exploiting that confidence is also a natural element of creating your own advantages. For example, presenting the destruction of your sentry gun as a false opportunity for a push is a perfect way to get people to walk right into your frontier justice crits. Honestly, the frontier justice is just such an amazing weapon to bait people into approaching you because of the crazy amount of burst damage, but it can be done with any shotgun if you position yourself intelligently. Oh, look at me, I'm just a helpless engineer with a pistol sight. Basically, understanding your weaknesses just as well as the enemy's weaknesses is such an important part of playing Battle Engineer effectively. The microscopic choices you make decide your fate at the macro level, so keeping every option you have in mind at all times can turn even the most unfortunate situations into a successful outcome. It's important to understand not only your strengths and weaknesses, but also your value to the team as a battle engineer. Typically there is a hierarchy of value when it comes to certain classes, but this is also highly dependent on the player operating the mouse and keyboard behind it, as well as the game state of that particular match. But usually, given the assumption that every player is performing at an above average skill level, this is the way that it usually goes when it comes to who is the most valuable in terms of staying alive. And this isn't an official ranking of power necessarily, it's more of a loose guide to which classes are worth sacrificing your life for and who doesn't always need to be chased down if it's going to mean you're giving up your own life to secure the kill. But it's helpful to know which classes are higher than your own value because as a battle engineer, you're now going to be putting yourself in more positions where you'll be able to make the decision to go deep for that medic pick. And yeah. Medic is obviously the crown jewel of good trades when it comes to every class, so if you have the opportunity to get a guaranteed kill on a medic, shoot your shot. And of course the other two classes above your pay grade, Sniper and Demo Man, are worthwhile trades to make, but yeah, uh, Medic, mostly Medic. Tasty, tasty med picks. Gotta love them. You're goddamn right. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. 
Making valuable trades or focusing down certain influential classes in general is a pretty easy concept to remember, but like I said, class trades are one thing, but always keep tabs on who is performing the best out of the enemy team's roster. No matter what class they're playing, even if they're carrying their team to victory as spy, it's always worth making the best out of your own life for the good of the team as a whole. You might already be familiar with the concept of surfing because it's typically something in a medic main's wheelhouse, but surfing is something that every class can do, and often it can be used to great effect. But in case you're uninitiated, surfing is basically using the knockback that all damage does in TF2 to intentionally propel yourself in an advantageous direction. Basically, it can be summed up as using the enemy's rocket to rocket jump. This can be an amazingly useful thing to do as an engineer because his mobility is naturally relatively low, so he'll take all the help he can get, even if it means intentionally walking on top of a sticky bomb from time to time. But you don't have to only surf off of explosives. All damage in TF2 has some degree of knockback, so if you're trying to escape a situation, you might want to get into the habit of jumping so that even bullets can send you in the direction that you're already going faster than you could have gone. Right here I'm being chased by a heavy so I jump off the roller to send me a little further in that direction, and then I surf off his bullets to carry me the rest of the way. Later on we'll go over short circuit jumping which typically only takes you a certain distance into the air when jumping off of an enemy, but timing a jump with damage that you take from them as well can often send you flying, making it easy to use predictable melee hits to basically leave any situation when you see fit. Surfing damage in order to escape, anywhere from long soaring arcs across the map to subtle yet effective horizontal hops to safety, is usually the most common way to use this technique to improve your survivability as Battle Engineer, and you can often end up in some pretty funny situations if you get into the habit of doing it enough. But a similarly useful way to implement surfing into your playstyle is to use it to close distances that you normally wouldn't be able to in time, giving you higher damage on your shotgun as well as throwing off the enemy's aim. In fact, a lot of the time when you go high enough or fast enough, they won't even know where you went. Sometimes even you don't even know where you went, but hey, it ends up somehow working out. I killed their sniper and I also definitely killed their medic there. We can just you know, cut to the next clip because it's pretty obvious that I totally did that. Surfing just for the pure utility of briefly confusing your enemy is enough to warrant practicing this technique whenever you can, so next time you see a rocket aimed at your feet, just crouch jump to see where it takes you. After a while, you'll be able to start using it to your advantage in more ways than one and improve both your survivability and movement by a significant amount. TF2 is such an old game at this point that the default settings are merely a product of the time in which it was made, that time being the year the iPhone was invented. We have invented a new technology called fingers. Yeah, 2007 was 30 years ago. Feel old yet? So if you haven't changed the majority of your default settings in order to bring the game up to speed to the modern basic expectations of a first person shooter, such as enabling hit sounds or increasing the FOV from 70 to 90, you should probably watch this five minute guide by Chow Libo Pei. It's linked in the description. But past that, a lot of the further editing that you can do to TF2's appearance and in-game functionality is purely down to preference. From things like your mouse sensitivity to using a complete completely different custom HUD. The settings that I use are personal to me, so when it comes to the vast majority, I would only recommend them because I like them, not because they're objectively the best settings. A good example of this is how I have my metal count directly below my crosshair so that I don't have to keep an eye on it in my peripheral vision while looking at the center of my screen. I highly suggest that if changing your HUD, your graphical settings, or various key bindings is something of interest to you, go ahead and check out sites like GameBanana or HUDs.tf to find different community created mods and custom configuration scripts that can personalize the way that you play TF2. But when it comes to the engineer, there are a few very useful scripts that I honestly think should be included within the class specific option in the base game. The major one that completely overhauls the speed at which buildings can be constructed is the PDA bypass script. You may have noticed that in every clip in this entire video, I have never taken out my construction or destruction PDAs for even one frame. That's because Valve subtly included these commands that you can type into the developer console to do everything that your PDA does. These commands can be bound to keys, making it so that you can simply press one button to take out a building blueprint. And because commands can happen within one frame, this enables the ability to create scripts that instantly destroy 
and prepare a building with just the press of one button. This makes it trivial to destroy and deploy battle buildings as it only requires you to press a key and then click your mouse, as opposed to pressing a key to open your destruction PDA, pressing a key to choose which building to destroy, pressing a key to open your construction PDA, pressing yet another button to choose which building to place, and then finally clicking the mouse to place the building. Even compared to the fastest hands in the West, this script can make constructing and destroying your buildings as seamless as they possibly can be. This script comes into play so often for Battle Engineer, and it's honestly kind of strange to me to imagine a time when I didn't use it. It especially helps the speed in which you can place down distraction sentries, and it definitely makes your ability to quickly slap down a building in order to change the flow of battle on the fly go from not even a realistic option to extremely easy. And because you both destroy and deploy a building with the same key, this script works fantastically with the Frontier Justice, as it essentially functions as a big red, I really need crits in this exact situation right now button. Talk about baiting confidence when your enemy can't see that you have crits stored in your sentry that you can just cash in on in less than one second. In a similar vein, there's also the added utility of what I like to call a tactical destruction, where you intentionally blow up a building before it inevitably gets destroyed to slightly confuse your enemies. For example, my mini sentry is about to go down to this demo man's rollers, and right before it explodes, I destroy it myself to more efficiently replace it, and the demo man sees that he didn't kill the gun, so he pointlessly shoots another pill over there, and that's a pill that didn't do any damage, which is an absolute win. Not to mention I denied him another destruction point, because fuck you. A neat thing about having access to the Destruction Bind in particular is being able to blow up your buildings while you're dead, which comes in very handy when you need to prevent a teleporter from being camped, as well as denying any approaching spies from violating your buildings with a sapper, which might be something that comes off as petty, but in reality is totally worth it just to deny them the possibility of getting a Diamondback crit. And also denying the Destruction Point because fuck you. Overall, this script does so much for Battle Engineer that, in my opinion, it's almost a requirement for implementing this playstyle effectively. I personally prefer to have the bind to destroy and build a sentry on my middle mouse button, and the bind for my dispenser, teleporter entrance, and teleporter exit on my 4, 5, and 6 keys respectively. If using the PDA is already embedded in your muscle memory, this may take a few days to get used to, but after you become familiar with it, I promise you will not regret doing this. If you want to learn more about how these binds work, I suggest checking out Zealot's video about them so you can better understand how to attribute them to keys that are more comfortable for you if you wish. The other bind that I feel is very important to the engineer's utility is the loadout bind, also sometimes called the resupply bind or banny bind. These are commands that automatically switch between your A through D loadout presets that you can set up in your inventory. This can be useful on many classes, but I feel like it's especially important to the engineer simply because so many of his unlocks are situationally advantageous, and being able to change loadouts quickly in order to fit those moment-to-moment -moment situations is integral to making the best of the Battle Engineer playstyle. Later on, I will go over in better detail what loadouts you should keep on call, but even beyond just being able to switch between different wrenches without opening a menu, having a loadout bind can save you from many dangerous situations such as retreating into your spawn room that you can easily die inside of. If you press any of your loadout binds, including the one corresponding to the loadout you're currently on, you will effectively respawn instantly with full health and ammo. This can be especially useful to the engineer when it comes to certain spawn rooms that have resupply cabinets located at a pretty unreasonable distance away from the spawn door, such as Swiftwater's massive red spawn. I personally like to have all four of my loadout binds on my number pad, each letter corresponding to its number, but I do realize that some people may consider this to be too far out of the way for them, or they just may not have a keyboard with a number pad on it at all, so I suggest binding these commands to whatever you feel is comfortable to you. I have a feeling that once you incorporate these scripts into your gameplay, you will find that they come into play so often that you'll wonder how you even managed without them. If you'd like to take a look at the details of the scripts and settings that I personally use every day, you can go and visit uncledane.com settings. However, I highly suggest that you do not install these configs one-to-one -to, -one to your game and instead use the files as a reference point for creating your own personalized configurations. Okay, so we finally made it to the part of the guide where I specifically tell you what to do and how to play in order to be good at Battle Engine, right? Yes, let's go! 
Well, no, but I, I do think that it's important to understand all of the advantages and disadvantages to each of the engineer's weapons when specifically applying it to Battle Engie, so that's what we're going to be doing for every primary, secondary, and melee weapon that he can equip. Now, keep in mind that I've been making videos about Engineer for almost a decade at this point, so at the time of this video's upload, I've made separate reviews and dissertations talking about every single weapon that the Engineer can equip, often more than once. So in the interest of not repeating myself too much, I'm only going to be briefly focusing on talking about which items are useful to the Battle Engineer playstyle, and if you want a more generalized discussion about a specific weapon, go ahead and hit up my weapon reviews playlist after this video. With the exception of just that one weapon, I do actually believe that all of the Engineer's options are honestly pretty good, and there isn't necessarily a choice you can make that will guarantee your failure or success as Battle Engie. So instead of making a tier list or something like that, I'm going to be putting each weapon somewhere on the spectrum of defensive and offensive. The closer to one end of the scale the weapon is, the more useful it will likely be to the type of battle engineer you're playing, because you can very effectively play it either way, and that choice is up to you. We'll start with the melee weapons, or his wrenches, all of which aid in the construction of his buildings and therefore act as almost entirely utility rather than damage. Starting on the more defensive side of things here, we'll just lump the Southern Hospitality and the Stock Wrench together and get those out of the way real quick. I believe these wrenches are the most inherently defensive weapons that the engineer can equip simply because it just doesn't really change very much about his sentry gun. Because these two items encourage sustainability over speed or movement, these are clearly the pick for if you're going to be keeping a level 3 sentry gun alive and well for as long as possible. Therefore, if you're going to be playing Battle Engineer, these wrenches don't really allow you a lot of space to roam around outside of your established nest. However, the Eureka effect, despite being just as building health oriented and actually slower at constructing than the previous two wrenches, truthfully plays into the Battle Engineer role more than you'd expect if only for its ability to travel around the map quickly and efficiently. The Eureka effect is the ultimate setup wrench and I'm constantly using it during my first life at the start of a round just to get the cheaper teleporters, but I don't just switch back to something right away because honestly, building boosting is sort of overrated when you're only concerned about getting the supportive buildings in their designated spots then you can just start blasting people. A very effective way to use the Eureka effect as a battle engineer is to always roll out with it. Get your teleporter where it needs to be, put the dispenser where your team might need it, and if you have enough metal to plop down a level 1 sentry, you do it, and then you just start playing battle engine as you normally would. Of course, because you do have 125 health, it's better to play a little less aggressively than if you were rocking the gunslinger with a full overheal, but if you ever find yourself in a pickle, you do have a get out of pickle free card up your sleeve that you can use to go back to spawn and make a more informed choice on what you should continue to do now that you've appropriately assessed the state of the battlefield. And you might as well also take that moment to upgrade your teleporter in half the time you normally would need to, even faster when you switch to the Jag. Obviously, you can also use the Eureka effect in Engineer, which is basically where you hide teleporters behind the enemy and use it as your very own spawn point when you want to guarantee your ability to flank. But for basically every situation you could end up in as Battle NG, the the ability to leave the area unharmed is sort of like a more tactical version of the scout spawn atomic punch in a way, and it's very undervalued in my opinion. When using the Eureka effect aggressively and intelligently, you sacrifice a little bit of your building speed for some solid mobility while retaining all of your other basic stats. Overall, this is a pretty good stat lineup for the battle engine, and I highly recommend working the Eureka effect into your loadouts as often as you can. Now let's talk about the Jag. The Jag is awesome, okay? <laughs> and I'm about to say something that you other battle engineers don't want a level 1 sentry gun is better than a mini sentry. It's just effing facts. It does twice as much damage, it has more health, and with the Jag, you can actually construct it faster than an unboosted mini sentry if you just hit it a few times. The Jag is one of the best battle engineer weapons, and I'm tired of pretending it's not. Because your sentries cost the most metal out of all your buildings, and the Jag keeps your max health at 125, I will say that it's still more defense oriented than the gunslinger when it comes to your personal abilities, but in a lot of situations, it's quite Quite viable to just keep playing within the bubble of your sentry's range, and when that bubble absolutely shreds anyone who steps inside of it, the surprise combination of that plus an engineer with a shotgun is pretty much unsurvivable, and your personal health pool doesn't really end up mattering as much. So yeah, the Jag is 
probably the engineer's best all-around wrench for most situations in TF2, so it might come as no surprise that the situations that the battle engine gets himself into are definitely included in that. Its incredible speed with no downside to your sentry's base damage output pretty much makes up for its lack of health sustainability and ends up being a fantastic option when you want to more evenly spread your damage capabilities across yourself and your sentry gun. And then we have the Gunslinger, which is probably the only unlock that anyone ever thinks about when it comes to Battle Engineer, and... Well, that makes sense. The Gunslinger does a lot for an aggressive playstyle. In particular, the extra 25 max health, placing the Engineer within a health pool that nudges him into proper combat class territory. This extra health makes it so you can live through a lot more things, such as two 65 damage melee hits, and it also allows you to get buffed to 225, which I don't need to tell you, is extremely valuable. The Mini Sentry is a pretty fair trade-off for the personal benefits the Gunslinger provides. Its damage is definitely enough to push the Battle NG's DPS over the for most 1v1s, but the major downside is how easy it can be to destroy if it's placed out in the open where anyone can see it. In my opinion, the major benefit of running minis is just how fast and cheap they are to replace when they inevitably get destroyed. So the Gunslinger ends up being a lot more of a useful choice for when you're playing against a team who is adept at destroying buildings of any size, and it's much better to always have something watching your back than to sometimes have nothing. And lastly, the Gunslinger is the only engineer melee weapon that has an actually interesting damage mechanic where you can always get a guaranteed crit when you punch someone three times in a row. Go ahead, Dane. Make my day. <laughs> Melee hit registration sometimes messes with this number, but it honestly comes in pretty handy, no pun intended, in particular against heavy players due to how slow they are and how easy it can be to dodge their tracking at melee range when they feel someone tapping on their shoulder. A non-overhealed heavy will always go down in three hits to this combo, which can sometimes be faster than trying to shoot them four times with a shotgun, so if you see a Puda standing around, don't forget you have the ability to punch people. And honestly, meleeing somebody after shooting them once or twice with your shotgun is a pretty underrated combo in general, since people usually move erratically when they're getting jumped and the melee hitbox is much larger than the hitscan hitbox. When it comes to the engineer's wrenches, most of them are quite useful to the battle engineer playstyle, and I often find myself switching between the Eureka effect, the Jag, and the Gunslinger quite often during a typical match. I highly suggest getting familiar with the different upsides of equipping each of them in the situations that benefit the most from their use. These secondary options for Battle Engineer are unfortunately pretty limited and end up being a little less nuanced than his wrenches or his shotguns as a result, but there are still many benefits to using each of them in their own respective situations, so we'll just get right into it. The Wrangler, as you may already be aware, is the Engineer's strongest defensive item by far. The amount of effective health this thing gives your sentry gun is just absurd for how little effort it takes to use, and therefore, it is obviously going to be an effective item to use no matter how you play engineer. However, because it completely shifts the utility of a secondary slot from being applied to the engineer to the sentry instead, this item is entirely dependent on your sentry gun. Positioning yourself near your sentry gun, taking control of your sentry gun, basically relying on only your sentry gun to output and absorb damage. And because the Wrangler is only useful when used in conjunction with your sentry gun, you lose a lot of what makes the battle engineer a powerful opponent in my opinion. You sort of become your sentry as you're not able to fire your shotgun and aim your Wrangler at the same time. Two different sources of damage becomes one source of damage, and that is usually a lot easier to kite around and deal with than the much more fluid strategy of splitting your offensive and defensive powers between yourself and your buildings. Therefore, I tend to view the Wrangler as more of a defensive item than anything, and the listed stats generally only benefit an engineer who is trying to maintain a sentry rather than use it as a dynamic area denial tool. However, there are many ways to use the Wrangler that can allow the battle engineer to take his mobility a little bit further in certain areas of specific maps, in particular using it to bullet jump into areas that would normally be inaccessible, allowing him to flank more effectively and get into positions that can cause a lot of problems in general. There is also also the extremely niche and frankly gimmicky utility it can provide in sentry jumping which unfortunately isn't the most viable way to get into an attacking position and live to tell the tale. It's fun, but the cost to the engineer's health is often too great to consider it anything more than just a fun thing to do to farm interesting clips for your pub frag videos. Overall the Wrangler is just an insanely busted item that is pretty much a must pick when playing defensively alongside your level 3 sentry gun, but because the battle engineer is typically 
likely going to be more mobile, more fluid, and more independent from maintaining his sentry in general, I consider the Wrangler to be one of the more limiting battle engineer items and, weirdly enough, his least useful secondary item when playing aggressively. Speaking of weird, the short circuit is definitely a weird gun and there are so many things to say about this thing that I don't think I'll ever be done talking about it to be honest, but in the context of Battle Engineer, I think the short circuit is actually pretty darn useful. The high cost of the projectile deleting ball is rough if you don't pay close attention to your metal cost because if you're practicing your ABCs, liberally using this thing can set you back a ton and you'll be caught without any buildings to show for it pretty easily. And while the primary fire is basically a joke, it's not entirely useless, it does still do damage, and you can use it to finish off an enemy who happens to be right up in your face, or you can use it to more easily track an invisible spy, although the alt fire is a much more reliable yet expensive way of making sure the spy doesn't survive. But if you use the short circuit intelligently, it can honestly be a battle engine's best friend when it comes to fighting demo men and soldiers, two of the engineer's most difficult classes to take on in a 1v1 encounter. Now, the short circuit isn't the perfect counter to projectile classes. It's certainly no pyro air blast. It doesn't reflect the damage back at your enemy for mini crits or anything, and it definitely doesn't have the forward range of a truck, nor can you keep spamming it up to 10 times in a row before you run out of ammo. So you actually have to aim it, use it strategically, and remember that you still have to deal the final blow most of the time since it only does an average of 30 damage by itself. But if you get into the habit of using it in combination with your shotgun, the short circuit can give you a pretty realistic fighting chance against soldiers as long as they don't switch to their shotgun in order to counter you. But let's be honest, what soldier is running the shotgun in current year, am I right? Diffusing a demo man sticky trap is also extremely helpful, although while it does come in pretty clutch for preventing air detonated stickies from killing you, it does end up becoming a little less useful when you remember that you have a perfectly functional sticky bomb deleter in your primary slot that is not only faster but doesn't use a third of your entire metal supply. But beyond just equipping it when the enemy team has four or five soldiers roaming around giving you problems, the short circuit actually has a mobility tech that I've known about since its introduction in the Blue Moon update, yet never considered to be an actually useful mechanic until I watched a video by Anthid where he fully demonstrated the viability of it, short circuit jumping. This is a physics quirk that I'm still in the process of fully understanding, but basically if you shoot a short circuit ball at the ground when you're standing close enough to an enemy to where you're both hit by the ball, you're sent into the air a far enough distance to where you can get on top of their head. The usefulness of this tech actually goes beyond just confusing your enemies or closing the distance to a target you intend to kill by jumping off of a different person, short circuit jumping is also a fantastic option for escaping, especially when it comes to getting away from someone who is trying to melee you, or putting some distance between you and someone who is just too close for comfort in general. Look, a trick stabbing spy, you're nasty, you stink, don't touch me, I'm leaving now. Overall, the short circuit is a weird, crazy, and pretty dang useful item for the battle engineer, and between its ability to give him a fighting chance against his main counters, and a mobility tech that can allow him to secure kills, confuse enemies, and make grand escapes, the short circuit is a pretty great option to equip when you find yourself getting gibbed a little too much. Now, I tend to believe that every engineer player has their wrangler phase early on, they go through their short circuit phase for a bit, but at the end of the day, nothing truly compares to the pistol. Being a stock weapon, it's easy to ignore this thing, even in a shallow pool of options, but man, the pistol rocks! The engineer is a squishy class, even with the gunslinger there's not really any way around it, so he often has to build his way to safety, and that usually involves a sentry gun or two. But the easiest way to ensure you take a limited amount of damage as engineer is simply staying out of the effective range of classes that can see you. The pistol makes it not only viable, but very effective to keep your distance and put out some serious damage, something that is normally not possible if you're relegated to only using your shotgun. Using the pistol as battle engine simply gives you more medium range damage and allows you to chip down players who are attempting to escape, soften up enemies who are approaching you, finish off enemies who survive after you've expended your primary weapon's ammo, and to just generally follow up on damage your teammates do from a distance that doesn't put you in immediate danger. Yes, the pistol has practically no utility for the engineer besides just raw damage, and that's perfect for a playstyle that is formulated around min-maxing damage and utility. We'll go over it later on, but the pistol is often a perfect 
addition to practically every single Battle Engineer loadout that I consider a staple. And once you get accustomed to using it as your primary source of medium range damage and reserving your shotgun for close range encounters, I feel like you'll have a hard time justifying using anything else unless the situation specifically calls for it. The pistol is basic as all stock weapons are, but I actually consider it to be the Battle Engineer's most offensive option as its ability to reliably spam damage at range, greatly helped by its practically infinite ammo capacity, is just too good to pass up if you're going for high DPS that covers your basic weakness of being unable to tank a lot of shots in close quarters combat. Overall, the Engineer's secondaries are a limited few, but each option provides utility or damage in their own unique and interesting ways, and I highly recommend getting in the habit of using each of them when the situation demands it. And finally, we come to the big boys, the shotguns in Engineer's Arsenal, the burst fire damage dealers that make Battle Engie a force to be reckoned with. When it comes to the primary weapons for Battle Engineer, I'd say that all of them actually have a pretty solid role within the playstyle with the exception of just one, and you'd probably think I'm gonna say that it's the Rescue Ranger, but nope, it's this thing in the garbage can over in the corner where it belongs. I'm not even gonna dignify the Pomson with anything more than just saying, don't bother using it, ever. It's just not a good gun. It's supremely unfun to play against, even more unfun to use yourself, and I use it so little that I often forget it exists entirely, and so should you. The Rescue Ranger, on the other hand, is ironically a better damage dealer and and has much better utility, even though it's often considered one of the engineer's staple choices for playing defensively with level 3s, but hear me out when I say that it can also be used effectively as a battle engineer weapon. Now, the damage aspect isn't great, but it's not useless. Once you get used to the projectile, it can be a decent to medium long range damage option if you're just trying to finish someone off, and it kind of inappropriately is a solid option for destroying enemy buildings. But obviously the main draw of the Rescue Ranger comes from its utility. Being able to heal and move buildings at any range at the cost of metal is just too useful to relegate only to using it to help maintain your defensive nest. I'll talk more about this in the next chapter, but I personally believe that using the Rescue Ranger along alongside the pistol and the jag is a fantastic loadout for playing as the hybrid offensive defensive battle engineer who operates best at medium range and within his powerful bubble of influence. And while it's undoubtedly the most defensively tuned weapon out of the engineer's shotguns, the Rescue Ranger is still my favorite weapon in TF2 and I never turn down the opportunity to use it offensively when I can. The next option we have just so happens to probably be my second favorite weapon in TF2, the Frontier Justice. This gun, in a lot of pretty common circumstances, is quite frankly bordering on overpowered in my opinion. The Frontier Justice is the definition of a snowball weapon. What that basically means is, when it rains, it pours. And what that basically means is, the better you're, you're doing, doing, the more likely you'll continue to do well. In other words, this is just a straight up pub stomping weapon. No offense to any of you guys out there, but generally, good players don't get killed by sentry guns that they should know are there more than a couple times a match, if at all. So if you're up against a team with even a handful of goobers who just run headfirst into your sentry over and over again, you're basically just gonna be able to punish the rest of them for it pretty easily. But even outside of the matches that are tipped in your team's favor and allow you to go on rampages at poorly designed matchmaking's expense, the Frontier just is still a fantastic option to keep in the back of your mind at all times. Because your sentry gun doesn't get destroyed when you switch loadouts that use the same type of sentry and the engineer has a pretty reliable relationship with the spawn room in general, it's pretty easy to exploit the Frontier Justice even when you don't spawn with it right off the bat. Right here I see that my sentry has racked up a good amount of kills, something that I couldn't have foreseen at the start of this match which is why I'm not on Frontier Justice, but in the instances where you're not terribly busy, a short jog back to spawn is totally worth it just to go grab the glow stick. And now the enemy will know the wrath of my revenge. Rare high moment. And if you're like me and you're not into jogging as much as you are into teleporting, the Eureka effect constantly gives you perfect opportunities to switch off of a more reliable gun to a straight upgrade when it suddenly becomes one. Because yeah, the Frontier Justice is a straight upgrade to the shotgun, but only when you have crits ready. Whether those crits are currently on you after your sentry was either destroyed by the enemy or by your own strategical hand, or chilling on your sentry gun waiting to be cashed in on. 
So honestly, unless you're absolutely sure that the enemy team is not going to be able to avoid clumsily stumbling into your bubble every chance they get, I don't think the Frontier Justice is a great rollout weapon to equip. When you have crits, only having three shots doesn't really matter that much because you're doing triple the damage with no fall off. So while the sustainability of your fights is less over time, the burst damage is just so high that its halved reserve is pretty much null and void. But when you don't have crits, it's not really worth engaging in fights with full health enemies at all. For this reason alone, I consider the Frontier Justice to be more defensive leaning than the following options, since you have to play more defensively until you can build up its power in order to start effectively using it. But regardless, I still consider the Frontier Justice to be a crazy powerful unlock for the battle engine and I am constantly working it into my loadouts at every chance I get, often switching to it in between lives and sometimes even in the middle of lives just to get those sweet sweet revenge crits at the cost of being a little bit more willing to let my sentry gun get destroyed from time to time. The next gun we have is the panic attack which I consider to be the perfect all around option for engineer no matter what you're up to but even more so when you're playing aggressively. On certain maps, specifically maps with a lot of choke points or areas that influence close quarters combat, the panic attack attack is pretty much just a better shotgun. It does considerably more close range damage, in particular it's helpful for securing kills on certain classes such as two-shotting a soldier or three-shotting a heavy, but honestly there isn't really much else to say about it besides I really like using the panic attack, specifically in more tightly spaced maps like Dust Bowl or Gold Rush, and just generally when playing casual mode to offset the downside that random bullet spread brings to the table when it's in effect. In a lot of circumstances where the shotgun excels, the panic attack brings just a little bit more to the table in exchange for very little downside. So if you find yourself up in people's grills a whole lot more during a match, throw this thing on for a solid increase to your DPS. But the stock shotgun is a staple in any battle engineer loadout, and I honestly feel like it's never not a good idea to equip this thing if you're planning on getting into some good old fashioned scraps. I consider it to be a little bit more offensive leaning than the panic attack if only for its slightly better damage at medium range, but the comparison between the two when it comes to battle battle engine is pretty negligible overall. Again, I don't really know what else to say about the gun except, man, shotguns are just fun to shoot in TF2 and combining your ability to aim it with your ability to strategically place a sentry gun is the foundation of the core mechanics of battle engineer. I don't think I'll ever get tired of using this thing even if the other options are more fun or effective to splash into their respective situational advantages. The stock shotgun is all reliable through and through and that's never going to change as far as I'm concerned. The final primary weapon we have to mention is of course the Widowmaker, which is the pinnacle of battle engines with a full-on aggressive playstyle. Now I realize that to a few people out there who are very casual battle engineer players when they're feeling bored, the engineer class is just this item. You know, forget building anything, forget that whole support class part. The Widowmaker is honestly more like a scout subclass than anything. And I kind of understand why, because the major downside to using the Widowmaker is that when you have less metal, you have a smaller clip size that you can afford to miss your shots with. Therefore, the Widowmaker kind of encourages players with poor metal management to just straight up avoid upgrading or even building anything in the first place just so they can always have their Widowmaker fully available. So if you build a dispenser and a teleporter exit, you literally can't miss that one and only shot that you have on your primary weapon. Otherwise, you might as well be holding a rubber chicken in your hands. So if you want to effectively use the Widowmaker and be able to effectively play Engineer at the same time while you're managing your buildings and making your way in between ammo pack locations, you have to pretty heavily rely on your pistol, which is the only safe secondary to use alongside it, as well as your ability to aim in general. Honestly, the only time I roll out with the Widowmaker is when I have already established my supportive buildings in a previous life, because to tell you the truth, if I don't have anything built, I consider the risks associated with trying to efficiently build things and keep a supply of metal handy for if I get attacked too great to consider taking a lot of the time. So yeah, the Widowmaker is a pretty punishing weapon in more ways than one, but at the same time, with great risk also comes great reward. In the moments you already have your teleporter and dispenser built up and at level 3, your sentry gun is up and ready to go, a full stash of 200 metal on you, and the focus of a true gamer with precision aim. The Widowmaker is so insanely good. Remember when I said that the shotgun is a solid weapon with no downsides? Well, in comparison to the Widowmaker, 
there is one major weakness, and that is sustain. Simply put, almost every burst fire weapon in TF2 has to reload at some point, which means that classes like Scout, Soldier, Demo Man, Spy, as well as the Engineer, they have to stop firing for a moment to reload their gun before they can keep firing again. Entire classes are balanced around the reloading mechanic. For example, Scout has low health and high damage on his scatter gun, but he can only really mitigate the inevitable lack of sustain by using his high mobility to move in and out of combat in order to reload his scatter gun. The engineer's primary weapons do less damage and he does not have very much combat mobility, but what the Widowmaker does is take those weaknesses and says, all right, but if you can aim, you have infinite sustain. When there are a lot of enemy players to shoot and you shoot them accurately, the Widowmaker allows the engineer to stay in fights for literally however long it takes to end them. And when you don't have to reload while everyone else does, that is a major advantage that is extremely rewarding. Obviously, the ability to never stop firing as long as you connect your shots is effectively paired with a medic's uber charge, crits creek, or honestly any amount of healing so that infinite sustain can't be ruined as easily by just getting killed. So once again, medics, I am officially requesting a buff on behalf of all battle engineers who are ballsy enough to equip the Widowmaker and go Ham. The Widowmaker also happens to have a very slight but totally perfect for battle NG 10% damage buff that gets applied when you're shooting the same target that your sentry is also targeting. 10% seems pretty negligible, especially since you only really end up doing about 5 or 6 more damage per shot on average, but it's nice to know that the already effective strategy of applying double pressure to an enemy with both of your guns at the same time is a tiny bit more effective when using the Widowmaker. And yeah, let's give a quick shout out to Dispenser Armor. This weapon is probably the most extreme example of risk versus reward that TF2 has to offer the engineer, and despite its huge downsides from how much harder it is to maintain your metal to upgrade your buildings, to smaller things like shooting disguised spies counting as a miss, and being unable to effectively chip shot people at medium to long ranges, the upsides are so insanely rewarding when it comes to DPS and sustainability that I consider the Widowmaker a certified battle engineer classic. Overall, the prime primary weapon options are heavily geared towards an aggressive playstyle in general, and each of them provide a ton of value for the battle engineer. Get familiar with each one as much as you can, don't be afraid to switch between them anytime you find yourself in spawn when you think one of them could help you over the other. Practice your aim whenever possible, and you'll be putting out some serious damage in no time. All right, so now that we've gone over the individual strengths of each of the engineer's weapons, I thought it might be helpful to briefly mention a few of my personal favorite loadout combinations that benefit the Battle NG playstyle and why I use them as often as I do. The first one I'll talk about is not coincidentally the first loadout I use usually at the beginning of a round or life where I'm starting with nothing built. This loadout is what I'll call the Rollout Roamer, which comprises the Eureka effect, the pistol, and the shotgun, although you could switch the primary slot out with the panic attack depending on the map or server settings. Beyond just using this loadout to set up at the start of a round, especially to abuse the cheaper teleporters, I also like to use this loadout as just a general roaming around looking for stragglers kind of thing, and it also doubles as a great ninjaneering setup for when you find yourself deep behind enemy lines. But just due to the fantastic utility that the Eureka effect provides with being able to just teleport in and out of the spawn room at will, I consider this an extremely flexible loadout to run in general general as it can easily become any loadout in seconds. In a way, the rollout roamer is every loadout at once. All you need to do is decide to switch and bam, you can switch. But when it comes to reliability and consistency, I always think of this loadout, which I'll just call the deathmatch man, as the apex of battle engineer. The gunslinger, the pistol, and the shotgun with the panic attack switching in circumstantially is just a solid combination of weapons for any situation where you're running around, building, blasting, and 
bubbling in flank routes and choke points alike. It's also very useful to have the Frontier Justice on call in the moments you find yourself in spawn with kills in your gun. But if you find yourself on a map with not a whole lot of room to space yourself against enemies, or if you're frequenting the choke points alongside your team's pushes, I would highly recommend this loadout, the Gunslinger, the Short Circuit, and the Panic Attack, which I'll aptly name the Choke Point Warrior. The Gunslinger and the Short Circuit make your survivability in the face of projectile spam much higher at the cost of medium range damage output, while the Panic Attack affords you fantastic burst damage at close range. This is a pretty flexible Soldier and Demoman 1v1 winner, as well as a cart pushing loadout, and I find myself using it all the time on Payload and King of the Hill. But in the moments you have your buildings all up and putting in work, and you're in the mood to put in work on the front lines yourself with crazy DPS and sustain, there is no better option than the defense, which is what I'll appropriately name the iconic battle engine loadout that incorporates the gunslinger, the pistol, and the widowmaker. Shooting enemies is your main objective with this loadout, and it's best paired with a medic who doesn't discriminate against heal targets, so make sure you get your buff and run in blasting. But on the other end of the aggression spectrum, I also greatly enjoy switching out my primary's high damage capabilities for fantastic utility instead, and playing exclusively within my toxic gas cloud. This loadout I like to call the battle druid, or pistol ranger, equipping the jag, the pistol, and the Rescue Ranger becoming a formidable frontline engineer who can both dish out some pretty consistent medium to long range damage while also being able to maintain the buildings within his line of sight no matter where he is. I love to use this loadout when playing on payload offense and on maps with a lot more space to move around and abuse the ability to relocate my buildings at just the click of a right mouse button. Because of just how much ammo the engineer's pistol has, it's best to think of your primary and secondary weapon slots switching places, using the pistol as your main damage dealer and using the Rescue Ranger as your utility item. I think this is a pretty underrated Battle Engineer loadout compared to the previous ones, so go give it a shot. But the most underrated Battle Engineer loadout of all, at least in my opinion, is the final one I want to talk about, and that is the following. The Jag, the Pistol, and the Frontier Justice. Once again, I have to drive home the point that leveled guns are always better than many sentries when it comes to damage, health, and even speed when you use the Jag, and this pairs so well with the Frontier Justice that I've decided to call this loadout out the pub stomper. If the enemy team has only a few players who can't help running into your sentry gun, you will practically never not have revenge crits stored to blast everyone else with. This loadout snowballs so well on King of the Hill maps in particular that it honestly feels a little broken at times, and even in the instances when you're not using it, this loadout is so easy to have on call on one of your loadout presets that any time you're using leveled guns, you can easily switch to it the moment you realize you have some sweet guaranteed revenge crits waiting for you at spawn. It's worth noting that while each of these loadouts are fantastic to throw on when their respective perfect situations arise, it's the combination of these loadout combinations that truly unlock the versatility of Battle NG. This flowchart is a visualization of how I typically approach an average match of TF2 when playing Engineer, and you can see just how many opportunities there are to exchange weapons depending on exactly what is happening in order to min-max the effectiveness of not just your buildings, not just your personal damage output, but the combination of all of the above. I always have the most common four loadouts on call at all times on my loadout presets so that I can easily switch between them with my quick switch binds, and honestly there are so many options to choose from that I sometimes wish Valve would just add like 10 more of these. And while I'm making empty requests, I would also greatly appreciate it if dying was the only way that players reset their killstreaks because I find myself switching between loadouts midlife so often these days that getting a big killstreak is pretty rare, and I wish the killstreak counter wouldn't disappear discourage players from using loadout binds or switching to different weapons. Okay, we're almost done, but there are a few random things I wanted to bring up regarding Battle Engineer that I couldn't really fit comfortably into previous chapters, so you're getting all of those miscellaneous tips and a big tip dump right here instead. Uh, starting with a pretty simple one, just be careful when moving buildings around because you never know who's gonna just run up on you at any moment. Also, when you're using the Gunslinger, uh, don't forget to help your friendly level 3 Sentry NG upgrade his buildings when you have the chance. These guys are likely holding down the fortress, so it's in the name of the game to be a good teammate. <laughs> yeah. 
You see, oh, okay. When you're on Gunslinger, you require about 430 less metal to upgrade everything you have compared to someone running level 3 sentries, so make sure you throw in a helping robot hand when you have a chance. Another thing to keep in mind is that there exists a pretty underused mechanic in TF2 where you can pick up fallen weapons on the battlefield that your class is able to equip. This can come in extremely useful for the battle engineer who especially benefits from switching loadouts, in particular when it comes to the Frontier Justice. This guy beefs his Frontier Justice crit, so I go ahead and pick it up and show him how it's done. And how exactly is it done, you may ask? Aiming is such a complex thing to talk about and attempt to teach, but for Frontier Justice crits specifically, I'd say just make sure you slow down, track your target, and try not to freak out and flick your mouse all over the place. See, this guy's got the right idea. Thanks for the advice, buddy. But don't load up on too many revenge crits, though, because you can easily just die with all of them. Much better to just stagger them out when you can. And look, I know I'm talking about the Frontier Justice a lot in this part, but check this out. When you hit a spy with a crit right before he cloaks, you can still see where he's going because the critical hit marker follows his head. Wow, Spy is a well-designed class that isn't constantly screwed over at every moment. Huh? Spy is a bad class. So, that's it. I don't have any more Battle Engineer stuff to talk about, but before we go, I just wanted to reiterate what I said at the very beginning of this video. Battle NG is not a subclass, it's a playstyle. Now, I know that there have been many discussions and definitions thrown around about what a subclass is, but from my understanding of how the term is typically used in the TF2 community, a subclass is almost always tied to a specific item, a set of items, or just a loadout. Because you can't call a demo man a demo knight unless he has a shield equipped. You don't call a soldier who got a market gardener kill a trolger. You call a soldier who equips the rocket jumper a trolger. And you can't call a huntsman sniper a huntsman sniper unless he equips, well, you know, the huntsman. The definition of a subclass has always been more or less attached to the loadout rather than the playstyle, which is why I personally believe that Battle Engineer is not a subclass. I wanted to make this video to show just how open-ended the options are for Battle Engineer because in reality, you don't need to equip the gunslinger to play aggressive you don't need to equip the Eureka effect to be behind the enemy with a shotgun. You don't even need to use a shotgun to be on the front lines with your team. Battle NG is a choice you make, and the engineer can be so much more than just the class that you pick to keep the enemy from capping last. All you need to do is choose your favorite weapons and get in there. I'd like to extend a very sincere thanks to anyone who managed to make it this far in one sitting. This turned out to be the longest project I've ever made. I spent a lot of time working on it and I'm very proud of how it turned out. So thanks again so much for watching. If you ever want to go back and watch a specific section, the chapters are marked on the timeline, so it should be pretty easy to revisit a subject you want to brush up on in the future. Hello. Uh, this video is not sponsored. Instead, I wanted to do something a little bit more special. Uh, a limited time merch drop uh, with this design by uh, Cater Tot. You saw it earlier in the video. This is what happens when you practice your ABCs. You grow a long Chad-like neck and your wrench grows 10 times the size. And hey, this isn't no Teespring run. The quality of the shirt is top notch. It's got a custom tag print and a neat little sticker on it. And this is the only warning I'm gonna give you guys, so listen up. This shirt is only gonna be available for a very limited time after the upload of this video. So if you are watching this video even like two months after this video came out for the first time, then sorry, bub. This shirt is now a vintage collector's t-shirt and you can't get it anymore and you missed out. FOMO, 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 FOMO. So don't be that guy or girl who missed out because we're gonna be locking this thing away forever and you're gonna be sitting there without a dang shirt on your back in the nude. You don't want that, that's illegal. But it also helps the channel, it helps me a lot and it helps me decide if I wanna ever do this again because this is a different way of you know, making stuff and uh, I really appreciate you watching the video to the very, very end and roll credits credits are going now this is everything check it out